So thank you everyone for coming. Um, my name is Ed Bennett, for those of you who don't know me, and today I'm going to talk about how you can live a happier, more productive SSH life. So when we are using high-performance computers, and also when we're not, sometimes we make a lot of use of SSH to connect to other machines. And when we teach people to use supercomputers, then what we'll typically ask them to do is to say SSH, then their username, so ims.e.j.bennett, oops, at, and then the name of the machine, Sunbird, or on the, the fully qualified domain name of the machine, sunbird.swansea.ac.uk. You do that, you tell it yes, because I'm pretty sure that Sunbird hasn't had its fingerprint changed. Um, right, it asks me for a password, which I type. And I'm logged in. But that's somewhat laborious to type every time. Sometimes you can press up arrow in your history or press control R to bring it back, but ultimately you'd like something a little bit more streamlined than that. So if I press control D to disconnect. So the first thing you can do to make your SSH life easier is to save an SSH configuration. So I, I, see, I see a lot of people who don't do this, and every time they connect, have to type out a full domain name and a full username, and make one typo and have to retype it. And that gets tedious. So what we can do, if I ls space hyphen a, you can see I've got this .ssh directory that uh, SSH has created for me the first time I SSH somewhere. It makes this and saves in it a file called known hosts. I can cat .ssh slash known hosts, and it will give me the machines I've connected to, their IP addresses, and then a fingerprint so that it knows next time I connect that I'm connecting to the same machine and it's not somebody trying to spoof it, which is useful. But this directory needs to have certain permissions, so if I ls space hyphen d a .ssh, not a, l. You can see this needs to have no permissions for people who aren't me. So group and other shouldn't be able to read or write this file, because otherwise it exposes uh, security risk on your machine. And so SSH says, no, I won't read this file. So you need to have these permissions, which SSH automatically creates for you, which is why I connect to a machine before I create my config file. So what I can do, I can create a file called dot ssh slash config and I can store configuration options that will always be used when I connect to SSH. So this has a relatively simple syntax. It's got keyword and then the value that you want to be associated with that option. So the first the first one you need is host and this just tells SSH which host or hosts you're going to be referring to with this set of options. So I'm going to give this the name Sunbird. So whenever I type SSH Sunbird, it will pick up all of these options. Then within this, I'm going to indent this with tab. I don't know if you're required to, but I always do. It makes it clear that it's a, an option for this particular host. So user. My username is s.e.j.bennett and hostname is sunbird.swansea.hack.org. So press control O, write that out to ssh slash config, control X to exit. So now I should be able to type ssh space sunbird and I've not had to type that really long line. I just typed two words, SSH, Sunbird, and it prompts me for my password. And I can log in. So that's already simplified my SSH life. It's made things a little bit quicker. The, another thing that I can do, I'd really like it if I didn't have to type my password every time I logged in. And 
there's a way around this. There's a way that we can more securely, in some ways, um, interface with the cluster by using a public-private key pair. So I will have a private key that sits on my machine that only I have access to, and then I can hand round a public key to any machine I'd like to be able to connect to, and that machine will then be able to authenticate that based on that private key, I, it can guarantee that I have access to my... Based on that public key, it can guarantee that I have access to my private key, and so I am who I say I am, and I can log into that machine. So, if I'd been giving this talk two weeks ago, I would say, use, use public keys without path phrases, it's completely fine, everyone does it. You can make, use passphrases to make it more secure. However, two weeks ago, a large number of UK supercomputers were hacked by uh, using, pass, uh, using private keys that didn't have passphrases on them. So instead, I'm going to show you how you create an SSH private key that has a passphrase. So the first thing we do to create a, uh, a new public-private key pair is this command ssh hyphen keygen. So we're generating a key, so it's keygen. So it generates a public private RSA key pair. So you, you might find DSA keys in older machines, but these are no longer secure. So most modern machines no longer support them. I'm going to use the default location to save it, so press enter there. And now I need to specify a passphrase. Do not specify no passphrase because you will be enabling HPC facilities to get hacked and you probably will have your keys deleted. And then you repeat it. And it gives you some random art, which I'm not entirely certain how you use. Um, I've, I, I've, I've never done anything with this beyond looking at it and saying, isn't that pretty? Um, I think, I think it might be a fingerprinting thing. You can, you can see which key is which by showing some random art for it, but I'm, I'm not 100% certain. So now I've generated a key. Now I need to copy that key, or rather copy the public key, to the machine I want to be able to connect to. So again, I'm going to use Sunbird for this. I'm going to use ssh-copy-id. And I'm going to copy to Sunbird. Again, I've used the um, abbreviation Sunbird here, because that's pulling it out of my SSH config. And it's asking for my password for Sunbird. This is not the password for the key, it's the password for the cluster. So it successfully added my key to Sunbird. Now try logging into the machine with SSH Sunbird. OK. So now, it asks for my passphrase for this key rather than the passphrase for Sunbird. And I'm logged in. So you might think, just a second, you still have to type a password. So what's the point? Well, firstly, I, I can now use the same key for every cluster I want to be able to log into, which means I only need to use one password rather than having to remember which password I've used for a specific machine, which is already a slight quality of life increase. But the second thing I can do is I can use something called an SSH agent to keep track of my keys um, and save the password for each login session. So let's do that now. If I log out from Sunbird again, whoever's seeing the Sunbird active logs today is going to see a whole lot of me logging in and out. So to use the SSH agent, the SSH agent is an interesting command because you want it to run in the background. So you need to use a source to make it work. So I'm going to eval backtick SSH hyphen agent. Does that work? There we go. Agent PID 37150. That's what I wanted to see. We now have an agent PID. So we, we know we're running an agent. And if I PS dash A grab 37150, you can see that, yeah. PID 37150 is indeed the SSH agent. So that's going to sit in the background and store my SSH keys so that then I don't have to type a passphrase every time I log in. In principle, let's see if it works. So I need to tell the agent what, um, which keys I want it to look after. So if I type SSH hyphen add, 
it will automatically pick up my default key. If I wanted to add a different key I stored somewhere else, I could then specify it there, but by default it'll pick up my built-in key. So enter the passphrase. So now that has added that identity to its, to its memory. So now when I log into Sunbird, SSH Sunbird, it logs in with a key that I haven't had to type the passphrase for. And now I can log out, and I can log in again, and I can happily do that until the cows come home without having to type my password ever again until I close the terminal. So now, if I close my terminal, and I open a new tab, and I SSH some good, I've got to type my key password again. Cancel that, I don't want to do that. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to install a little hook into my bash profile so that whenever I create a new session, it automatically loads in all my keys into an SSH agent. And, oops, so I have an article open over on this monitor. It has a neat way of doing this. Rather than just running SSH agent SSH add, it will try and set this up in a slightly more sensible and, um, re I guess, resource efficient way. So I'm going to nano my .bash profile at the bottom. I'm going to add the, that 20 something lines. And I will post in the chat. And for those watching on YouTube in the video description, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe um, exactly where you can find this. So, Control O, Control X. So now, if I start another shell, It'll say initializing new SSH agent, enter my passphrase, which I do, it unlocks my identity, and then it's ready. So whenever I start a new shell, I, it means I have to type my password to a start a new shell, which is a slight amount of work, but then that means any SSH is completely unlocked from scratch. So SSH Sunbird will work, which is nice. nice. So, quit that. So, so that, that is passwordless, or mostly passwordless login. login. So, that is really nice. That is really quite useful. Um, so, the next thing I want to talk about is port forwarding. So, this is something that comes up more often than you think, is useful more often than you think, and isn't too hard once you get your head around what's going on. So this is also known as SSH tunneling. So what you're doing is you're creating a connection from a port on your machine to a port on Sunbird, or on whatever cluster you're connecting to, whatever machine you're connecting to. I'm going to create this in my config again. So now I'm going to add a new host, and I'm going to call it Sunbird v Sunbird VNC. So on Sunbird, there is a login mode that gives you access to VNC. So you can connect and make use of graphical environments. So again, I'm going to user s.e.j.bennett. And the host name for this login mode is vnc.sunbird.swansea.ac.uk. And as it happens, I have, I have on this login mode a VNC session running at port um, 5906. So VNC sessions start numbering at 5900 and work their way up. As people create more, then that number increases. Mine is running, mine is session number six, so it's running at 5906. So what I'm going to use is I'm going to use a local forward. And then the syntax here is the port I want to use on my machine, and then the host name and port I want to use on the remote machine. So I'm going to say 5906. Actually, let's call this 5910 to make it clear what's going on. 5910, localhost, colon 5900. 59, no, not 5900, 5906. So, 
this is going to do is if I connect to port 5910 on my local machine, SSH will then intercept that connection, pass it through, and instead on vnc.sunbird, it will then connect to localhost port 5906. So you could, in principle, do this across multiple hops. You could use it to point to any machine that your target machine can access. In this case, and most frequently when you're doing SSH shuttling, you'll use it to point at localhost. So now, if I SSH Sunbird VNC, it'll, it's a new machine, so I need to say that I'm happy to connect to it. It will pick up my keys because uh, VNC.Sunbird shares the same file system as the other Sunbird login nodes, so it's picked up my SSH key. Actually, let's take a look. If I look inside my .ssh directory here, you can see there is an authorized keys file. If I tail n one .ssh slash authorized keys, you can see this is at Ed Bennett at colorday.lam, which is the same machine that I'm currently on. So that is the key that I just generated. And that's the public key, so I can show it on the screen. But with the private key, I wouldn't want to share it on the screen because then you could use, you could intercept, you could pretend to be me, log into things as me, which is not what we want. Anyway, I've just forwarded a port, so let's see if that works. So if I move that window out of the way slightly, I can connect, let's connect to localhost port 5910 via VNC. I need a password because Sunbird requires password protection on its VNC sessions, which is eminently sensible. I type that in, and I am running VNC. You can see I was previously running the Intel Advisor here. Uh, tunneling has successfully worked. So again, if I disconnect now, that's, that's local forwarding. Uh, remote forwarding you'll probably use less often. Remote forwarding is if you want the machine you're SSHing to to be able to access your machine. So say if you're running some server that's making, making content available and you want it to be available to a process you're running on Sunbird, you could do that with a remote forward. But I almost never use that, so I'm not going to show that off. What is useful is the dynamic forward. So if I dynamic forward. Again, I need to specify its localhost. Let's, let's call this 8888 for the sake of having a number. Actually, let's not do this on Sunbird VNC. Let's do this on Sunbird instead. So let's move that line up to there. So now, my SSH to Sunbird. It will create a, a port forward, and it's this dynamic forward actually creates a SOX proxy server. So what I can do is I can now access the web as if I were sitting on Sunbird. So for an example of where this is useful, let me pull over this Google Scholar window. So let's say I want to read this paper, Analysis and Visualization of SSH Attacks Using Honeypots. I click here, and because I am not currently in Swansea University, then when I click PDF, this prompts me to log in. Because I'm working from home at the moment, like most other people I think on this call, I'm stuck at home. So I can't go into Swansea University to use my institutional subscription. So cancel that. I'm not paying for this article. What do you take me for? So instead, I'm going to go back and I'm going to open my Firefox preferences. I'm going to search for proxy. And instead of using my system settings, I'm going to use manual settings and the SOX host I'm going to say localhost port 8888. So now let's see if that works. 
There we go. And now it's still loaded. I'm still via a proxy. So I go through to this page. I click PDF. And now, because I'm accessing through Sunbird, it recognizes, oh, oh, yeah, this person is accessing from a Swansea University IP address, so I can give them access because they're clearly a Swansea University user and they have a subscription. So that is something that's really useful when you, when you need journals and you're not sitting in the university. So that does mean that when I press Control D to exit, it will hang because Firefox is still talking to the proxy server, so I need to then press Control C to cancel that. Um, you can do the same thing at the command line um, if you don't want to if you don't want to have a a, a socks tunnel every time you connect to the server. I can remove that line and instead ssh space hyphen capital D and then the port you want to use eight 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 sunbird. That'll do exactly the same thing. So I can go back twice here. And click through there again. And it's still, yeah, I'm still using the proxy server. And that'll still give me access. Yep, that's still working. Incidentally, it's worth taking a look at what you'll see if it doesn't work. If I log out again, I'm not connected via SSH now. So now, if I try and go back to that Google Scholar results page and refresh the page, it's going to say the proxy server is refusing connections because I don't have a proxy server running. So you need to be a little bit careful with that number because you want to not collide with anything else. So for instance, if you're running a Jupyter Notebook, that'll by default use port 8888, which might mean you might need to use a different number. The number is completely arbitrary. So as long as it's, I think it has to be above 1024 for you to not need root, but beyond that, you can pick any number you like. I probably wouldn't go above about 32,000. I think that might be where it tops out. Any, any, any four digit number should be fine above 1024. So that is how you can use um, tunneling and support forwarding and proxying to make your life happier when you're using SSH. Another thing that you can do is try and protect yourself against your connection dropping. So sometimes Uh, sometimes you might be doing some operation that takes a very long, long period of time, uh, like doing some kind of file copy from another machine. Obviously, if you're doing something that's compute intensive, you'll run that in, in the batch queue and you won't need to stay connected to the machine. But you might have some, some, some long run compile or, op or file copy or something that you don't want to run on the compute node, but you do want to keep running even if your machine accidentally disconnects. And something we can do to protect ourselves against this is using something called Screen, S-C-R-E-E-N. So I run Screen. You can see it's created me a new login shell. In fact, it's, it's technically it's not a login shell. Screen uses a non-login shell by default for some reason. And let's have some long-running operation. So. So that's going to, every two seconds, it's going to output a new number, and it's going to take, um, it's going to take around 2,000 seconds to run. So let's leave that running. So now I want to interrupt this connection. So something, um, I forgot how to do it. That's been a while. So yes. If you press tilde full stop, tilde full stop um, severs an SSH connection. So if you've ever got a process that's not responding and won't let you disconnect and you really want to escape your SSH session, you can use tilde full stop 
and it will break the SSH connection. Yeah, I thought it, that was what it was. For some reason, I just forgot it briefly. Um, so now I reconnect to Sunbird. You can see I'm still on SL1, which is what I was on before. For some reason, let me scroll up. Um, so now if I type screen space hyphen capital R, I think it's capital R. Yeah, screen, screen space hyphen capital, capital R, R um, restores a screen session. You can see that's happily been still running on Sunbird while I've been disconnected. I reconnect, and I can still keep interacting with it, and it's still working. Now if I want to cancel it, I can press Control C. If I set that running again, let's say I don't want to sever the connection, I just want to disconnect from that screen and leave it running in the background. I can do that as well, so that's running again, it's still outputting some numbers. If I press Control A and then D, then you can see it's detached that session. And if I want to, I can start a different session. I can type screen with no arguments again, it'll give me a new screen, and I can do something else that's not going to do very much. So do something else, do, doing a very similar thing but with different numbers. So now control A D will detach me from that session. So now when I try and screen space hyphen capital R to restore one of these sessions, it'll complain. I've got two screen sessions, I need to specify which one I want. You can get, also get an output with screen-ls, it'll list all the screens that are available. And then, if I want to recover, we still one of them, screen-r, and then I need the first n digits that will um, fully disambiguate which screen I want. So you can see the first, non the first unambiguous digit here is the 3 or the 4, so if I say screen-r203, it'll reconnect me to that screen. And the same thing for 204 will reconnect me to that screen. It's only if you want to if you want to, to use control A, that's control A followed by A, because screen overrides control A to refer to all of its own screen commands. So now I would, again when you disconnect this session or exit or control D, it'll say screen is terminating and screen dash ls will show I've only got one screen running, so screen-r will work, and I disconnect that session, screen-ls, no sockets found, all my screens are not working, or have finished. So, one other thing you can do in your SSH config that is really quite useful um, is something called a proxy jump. So if you want to SSH to a machine, that is only accessible from a third machine, you can tell it, uh, you can tell SSH to automatically make that intermediary connection. There. So if I want to connect to my work desktop, which is PY14208, then I can't connect to that from outside the university because it's firewalled, so protect my machine from attacks from the wider internet. I want to be able to connect to it from my machine here. So the host name is p11428.swansea.ac.uk. User is Ed. And now I can say I want to proxy jump off Sunbird. I want to connect to Sunbird first and then connect to my machine from there. So I'm going to say proxy jump Sunbird. I can say Sunbird because I'm referring to it from the line up here. So now, if I SSH to PY14208, it's going to say it's got no host IP with the proxy command, um, and I've not connected to this before from this account, so I need to say yes, I'm happy for that to connect. It asks for my password, because I haven't yet copied this SSH key to that machine, and now it logs me in, and because normally I use a different, I use a different um, terminal emulator, it's not displaying very well in the default macOS terminal. And if I wanted to then I could ssh hyphen copy hyphen id to py14208.
I give it my password for the remote machine. That's copied. Now I SSH P1 on for 208. And I'm logged in. Of course, I don't have to always use the same name. I don't have to use the same name as part of the domain name. I don't even have to use the same name every time I connect. I can also give this another, another name, work. And now if I SSH to work, it'll log me into exactly the same machine. machine. So I can, I can give it as many names as I like. So the last thing that I wanted to talk about from the SSH cookbook on multiplexing. So it's possible that in the near future, HPC systems will start to introduce uh, two multi-factor authentication for SSH connections, which means then whenever you log in, you'll need to get your authentication device and get a code off that and match that up, which will be annoying. So one thing SSH lets you do is um, save a particular connection and keep it alive and reuse that whenever you want to connect to that machine for some given period of time. So I'm going to copy and paste this directly out of the SSH cookbook. I will post a link in the chat and again to the video description when this goes on YouTube. So So rather than this, I'm going to use host asterisk here. So host asterisk means these settings should apply to every single machine I connect to. So I can say control path is where I want to put the files that handle all of this processing. Control master auto says automatically use a control master, which is this technology it uses to have a single connection established once that then it reuses. And then control persist is how long after I disconnect it will keep this alive before it calls it. So 10 minutes is reasonable. If you only connect every couple of hours, you might want to up that to something like 120 minutes. So, but normally 10 minutes is fine to protect you just if your connection drops and then you want to reconnect a couple of minutes later. I'm going to leave that for 10 minutes for now. So I need to NK to .ssh slash control masters. You can tell I'm doing this live and I haven't prepared it in advance because I keep making mistakes. So apologies for that. So NK to that. Now, the first time I connect, it takes a little bit more time because it has to do the negotiation to create my control master. But I do, this, do it a second time and it takes a quarter of a second instead of half a second. It's because now it gets reused in the same connection. So now, even if I didn't have my key, I think I wouldn't have to authenticate the second time because the authentication's already happened. So that is the end of the list of things I wanted to talk about. So that is the things I know about that will make your SSH life happier and easier and hopefully more productive. Most of them I use myself. A couple of them are new to me, control masters I haven't heard of before last Friday. So that is, hopefully, if we do have to introduce multi-factor authentication because of the recent security problems, then this will mean that it hopefully won't impact our lives too negatively. So with that, I am happy to take any questions that you have.